It's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Luciana Araujo, Professor at the Federal University of San Carlos and one of the two principal investigators on the Intermedia project. Some of you will know her personally, others through her work on Brazilian silent cinema or her books on cinema in Recife in the 1950s and on Joachim Pedro de Andrade. It's particularly appropriate to welcome Luciana as the first keynote of the conference, as her work is one of the founding bases of the wider project. Her research into intermedial practices in Brazilian silent cinema, looking at a variety of different interactions between theatre and film, is complex and diverse. And we're going to hear about some of those elements in her talk in a moment or two. But the work she conducted in this area before the project started um, shaped the whole in many important ways. Not least in relation to theatrical movie prologues. Um, Luciana did considerable research into the particular prologues that were performed in Silalandia, the marquee cinema district of Rio in the mid-1920s. Uh, the material I'm going to be presenting in my paper tomorrow is inspired by Luciana's work. Um, but it also shapes one of the really distinguished and distinguishing and exciting features of the project as a whole. So Luciana has located the scripts for a number of these prologues from the 20s, which were safe in the archives of the censor's office in the meantime. And uh, we're translating those scripts, we're restaging those scripts in 2018 uh, at the uh, Cinemateca Brasileira in São Paulo and then here in the UK at Reading at perhaps in other venues too. So in that, in many other ways, her earlier work has really shaped the fact that we're sitting here today. Finally, a, a personal note of thanks to Luciana and to her other Scar colleagues, who have been fantastic people to collaborate with. And they've also been wonderfully good at making us feel at home in relation to visiting Brazil, and for those of us Reading colleagues who aren't Lucia, in helping us to develop our knowledge and understanding of Brazilian cinema and Brazilian culture more generally. So I hope we here at Reading could be just as welcoming in return. And uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure to have you here, Luciana. Thank you very much. So, could you please help me? Yeah, uh, I'd like yeah to let's open, get rid of uh, this. Is this Well, hi everyone, good afternoon. Thank you, John, for your generous words. Um, it's a pleasure and also a, a great responsibility to be here to give this talk. And I would like to thank Lucia, not only for this opportunity, but also for having invited, uh, invited us for this amazing project we've been conducting. And it's been also a pleasure to work with, uh, with you, uh, the, read, the Reading team, fantastic team. Um, and for us, uh, and I'm sure I speak for myself and also for my beloved Federal University of São Carlos colleagues, uh, Flavia, Susana, Samuel, uh, and Margarida, who unfortunately is not here. Uh, it's been a great experience. Uh, when we... Uh, this intermediate project started in 2015, but the first steps were taken in 2011 when Lucia proposed to us to develop a project together. Back then, Brazil was a quite different country, and it is disturbing to see how much we have lost of the democratic achievements that we thought were already consolidated. So within this framework uh, in which public education has tended to become increasingly weaker, the intermediate project is more relevant to us as a way of reinforcing the importance of academic research conducted by Brazilian public universities. The research I have been developing, uh, let me change here. The research I have been developing within the intermediate project 
addresses the relation between cinema and theater in Brazil during the silent cinema period. Today I'm going to present some initial findings, and I like to stress initial findings, of a particular aspect of this research in which stage plays are the main object of study. The title is Cinema from the Stage Perspective. Okay. In film history studies, relations between stage and screen are usually investigated from the point of view of films and film activities. This talk proposes a detour, taking stage plays as its focus in order to study the intermediate encounters they promote involving film and film culture. Inspired by the conference title, I have chosen to explore the moving form of film from the stage perspective. The research encompasses plays staged in Rio and Sao Paulo from the late 1910s to the, to the 1920s, a period marked by the rise of mass entertainment industry in which popular theater and cinema, especially Hollywood cinema, played central roles Play central roles, sorry. Often considered a threat to theater, films and film culture also provided a variety of themes and strategies that were incorporated on stage. Theater would thus take advantage of cinema's growing popularity, establishing creative exchanges while also promoting attractions that would appeal to the general theater, theatrical audience. These talks this talk draws on Charles Mercer's proposal for an integrated history of theatrical entertainment, embracing both live stage performance and cinema. Uh, in a 2004 essay, Mercer argues that writing this integrated history, I quote, we reveal exciting convergences and interactions obscured by many years of scholarship that has treated them separately as rival arts. According to Mercer, a history of, of theatrical entertainment must keep in mind the relationship between stage and screen on many levels, that of personnel, subject matter and treatment, production methods, distribution of productions, advertising and promotion, as well as spectatorship. In my research, focused mainly on Rio de Janeiro's entertainment circuit, I found many film references on Brazilian plays, from mentions and parodies involving famous Hollywood stars to the impact of cinema on performance and stage mise-en-scene. Plays would also cover topics connected to film going, including film reception, audiences, censorship. I will start with uh, an experience in which a film itself is a stage element, besides being also the center of the plot. Just once. Um, a Viovinha do Cinema. The play A Viovinha do Cinema, The Little Widow of the Cinema, was staged in Rio in 1919 by the stage company head, headed by Leopoldo Frois the most famous Brazilian actor of the time. In A Viovinha do Cinema, a husband, caught by his wife arriving home early in the morning after a night out, takes her to the movies in order to distract her, not knowing that one of the films of the program has captured him wooing another woman at Guarujá Beach during a trip he had made a couple of years before. He bribes the exhibitor to remove the film from the program. But then the film is replaced by a similar one, featuring the same lady having a romantic date, this time with a close friend of the protagonist. As we can see, film and film going provide the very core of the plot. In addition, film is also a scenic element, since the movies uh, watched by the, the characters, are projected in the beginning of the play. The film screening thus functions as a prologue to the play, as stated by an advert advertisement in a newspaper, which also proclaimed it as the latest novelty of modern theater. As another promotional piece made clear, 
the novelty was not the cinematography, the, the cinematographic prologue itself, but its close connection to the plot. The prologue was the motive from which action derived. A Viovinha do Cinema was an adaptation by actors Apolonia Pinto and Brandão Sobrinho of a German play whose author, perhaps Oscar Blumenthal, is never mentioned in all likelihood to avoid copyright fees. Well, I didn't find, uh, it's a poor presentation in terms of pictures. I didn't find any picture of a Viovinha do Cinema, so there is a, a picture of another play staged in the same year uh, by the same company. Uh, just to give you an idea of the setting and, and the costumes. Uh, the original plot is set in Turin, Italy, and Ostende, the Belgian city by the sea. And it probably takes place at the end of the 19th century. The Brazilian version adapts the story to contemporary Rio and Guarujá Beach in Sao Paulo. Some changes were made in the manuscript itself. Here are some examples. Uh, where Ostende is replaced by Guarujá and Magic Lantern is replaced by cinema. It is important to say that the prologue with the, the film screening does not appear in the manuscript. Everything suggests that it was an idea specially developed to this particular staging. Beyond the obvious appeal to cinema and cinema's increasing popularity among Brazilian audience, some information concerning the professionals involved in the production of A Viu do Cinema may help to understand the creation of this kind of prologue. The play was staged at Teatro Trionon, owned by Giacomo Rosario Staffa, who had been one of the most important film exhibitors and distributors in Rio de Janeiro until 1917, when he left film business. Inaugurated in 1915, in the premises of a former movie theater, Teatro Trianon was next door to Cinema Parisiense, also owned by Staffa. For a short time in 1916, Parisiense and Trianon were turned into one movie, one, one movie theater, as you can see in this picture. Here's Staffa and the Parisiense in, this, in the middle, and then Trianon, right. Teatro Trianon, therefore, held a, st a strategic connection to cinema, both geographically and commercially. The actor Leopoldo Frois, head of the company, had already worked in film, starring in the 1916 production Perdida, Falling, directed by Luiz de Barros. Another key name related to the prologue was Alberto Botelho, who shot the film. He was a well-known cinematographer with a solid and productive career in both fiction and non-fiction films. The year before A Viu Vinha do Cinema, in 1918, he or his brother, Paulino Botelho, the source is unclear about that, had registered in film and photographs the lunch offered by Leopoldo Frois to Gaston Togero, author of another successful play, Siren Frois. All this parade of names and facts is meant to draw attention to the circulation of professionals between film and stage, who took part in theatrical entertainment as a whole. Besides all, uh, besides all that concerns personnel and subject matter, to resume the topics highlighted by Mercer, the relations between film and stage promoted by a Viovian cinema can also be traced in terms of advertising and promotion. The cinematographic prologue directly linked to the plot was an important selling point in the play's promotional campaign, being advertised as an original and modern novelty. In the ads, the prologue also received a cosmopolitan touch through the use of foreign expressions like dernierie in French and great attraction in English. A view in the cinema indicates how, how cinema's modernity could be incorporated by stage productions in different, in different ways, whether have cinema as the subject of the play or a stage element and also as part of promotional strategies. 
The very experience of watching a movie was artistically recreated in the stage prologue of the play Cinema Troça, opening in Rio de Janeiro in 1917. Cinema Troça could be translated as Cinema Mockery, and Troça is also, also refers to a, a small uh, carnival street group. Again, this picture is not from the stage prologue I'm talking about, but of another sketch of the same review called The Judgment of the Review. But my guess is that the, the prologue could have been staged in a similar way. Theater critic Mario Nunes had defined Cinema Trossa, Cinema, Cinema Trossa's prologue, as banal and immoral. The description we found in another review, however, suggests an elaborate staging simulating the, pro simulating the projection of a film. In place of the screen, there was a diaphanous veil behind which the actors performed in silence a drama of adultery, while actor and director Enrique Alves narrated the plot, similarly, similarly to, what to, what, to what early cinema commentators used to do. Cinema Troça demonstrates the impact of cinema also in terms of performance and stage mise-en-scene. Another example is in the play O Coco de Respeito, staged in 1921. Coco is a music genre, so translation could be uh, first-rate Coco. According to critic Mario Nunes, one of the sketches of O Coco de Respeito, in which the action takes place on a beach, had remarkable staging, an influence of Max Sennett, who, according to Nunes, replaced the beauty of the statues by well-shaped bodies in swimsuits with life and movement. This is Nunes talking about the, the sketch. Uh, Nunes gets enthusiastic about what he calls <laughs> Sennettism. As everybody knows, he writes, Sennettism is a new genre of fine arts and movement invented by Max Sennett, the great North American comedy director, who, dis who decided to choose, rather than classical antiquities statuary masterpieces, the exquisite living of today, veiled only by modeling swimsuits, a constant and ever-renewed glorification of the beauty of the female body. Here are the Oh, sorry. That's the, the sketch, Banhos de Mar, and here are the bathing beauties, too. I don't have any film clips, so I have to bring something to, you know. And, um, where am I? Okay. Uh, these remarks point out how Max Sennett and his bathing beauties popularity crossed cinema's borders and reached Brazilian stages, exerting an influence on the female artists' looks and their stage performances. In studies about Teatro de Revista, the Brazilian Review, scholars usually emphasize how foreign review companies, such as the French Bataclan and the Spanish Velasco, had a decisive influence on Brazilian Teatro de Revista throughout the, the 1920s. Bataclan, in particular, whose first tour was in 1922, is considered a turning point after which Brazilian Teatro de Revista would improve stage mise-en-scene, make the chorus girl's performance more uniform and, increase, and increasingly expose the female body on stage. Mario Nunes' reviews on O Coco de Respeito, however, indicate that even before Bataclan's first Brazilian tour in 1922, some of these changes had already started under the influence of North American cinema, which had become dominant in Brazil since the second half of the 1910s. Along with Bataclan, which turned out to be an artistic as well as a cultural phenomenon in Brazil, uh, Hollywood and the film culture created in, created by and around it, played crucial roles in the increasingly exposing of female bodies performing sensual move, movements and choreographies 
choreographies on stage. Cut, cut, cut. Okay. Historian Tiago de Melo Gomes, analysis in his book on Teatro de Revista in Rio, highlights the key role played by Hollywood cinema and Teatro de Revista in the ongoing process of cultural massification. Just to see. Both of, them, both of them very popular forms of entertainment. They helped to create a common repertoire shared by a large and heterogeneous audience. Hollywood's hegemonic position in the Brazilian market and its centrality among social and, centrality among social and cultural practices had a direct impact on Brazilian theater, especially on Teatro de Revista whose plays dealt with current events and trends. As Tiago de Melo Gomes writes, the plays, I quote, often address the novelties of modern life, exposing with humor some situations that these novelties provoked. Considering the many interactions between theater and cinema, Gomes points out how quickly the theater found ways to take advantage of film elements. Although, he argues, those interaction strategies also expressed cinema's dominant position. Faced with the Hollywood star system, ma system massive penetration, Brazilian stage plays often incorporated references to foreign film stars. The impact of Rudolf Valentino's death in 1926, for instance, resonated in Brazilian plays staged the following, the stage the following year. In the theater company Rataplan, headed by Luiz de Barros, the singer and actor Luiz Barreira impersonated in, the, impersonated in the play Mosaico some of Valentino's most famous characters. Uh, in this picture, we see Barreira, Luiz Barreira in character, looking like Valentino in the 1921 hit The Shake. Mm -hmm. Uh, Barreira performed in three sketches named after Valentino's films, Sangre e Arena, I don't know, it's in Spanish in the original, Blood and Sand, Paixão de Bárbaro, The Sheik, and Monsieur Boquer. Two other plays staged in 1927 refer to Rudolf Valentino. As Valentinos, or the female Valentinos, has a sketch in which girls sing and dance in praise of the loving artist, missing his overpowering languid look. Yeah, the, just the page. Apart from the title in this sketch, though, there is no other reference to Valentino or to cinema in general. A quite different approach can be found in Rodolfo Valentão, Rudolf the Bully, staged in Rio and São Paulo in 1927. The protagonist is described as a ridiculous type in his obsession to imitate Valentino, with, exa with exaggerated sideburns and wearing, wearing bell-bottom trousers, trousers and short jacket. As the play unfolds, many situations and dialogues revolve around Valentino and film topics. One of them is the arrangements made to shoot a promotional film for the protagonist's company, which is a rice powder factory another joke on Valentino's looks. The play's own promotional campaign took advantage of Valentino's popularity while also highlighting the well-known leading actor Jaime Costa, drawing a curious parallel between Hollywood and the local theater star system. Some years before, in 1921, the same actor Jaime Costa performed a role related to another Hollywood star, George Walsh, in the play Brutalidade, Brutality. Interestingly enough, the play not only featured reference to cinema, but was itself a stage adaptation of, uh, of the 1916 production, The Beast. Yeah, Brutalidade. The film, a blend of comedy, drama, and Western, was adapted into an operator, most of it performed following that modern American musical style, ragtime. Besides the musical and dancing numbers, the play also incorporated some traditional features of Western movies, such as a saloon, 
with cowboys, bandits, and gamblers, and a fighting scene in which the hero throws a bandit out of a window and then defeats the whole gang. In order to emulate the landscape of westerns, sets were painted and a number of structures were built to recreate a hill where the leading couple performed a farewell song and trenches placed backstage but visible for the audience in which Indians and cowboys fought. This description suggests that in Brutalidade, not only was cinema the source of the plot, but it also provided an inspiration to state mise-en-scene, as in the play O Coco de Respeito, performed in the same year. As for Brutalidade, another important connection to cinema concerned presentation practices. The play was staged at Teatro São Pedro, run by the Pascual Segreto Company, which had two more theaters located in the same square, Praça Tiradentes, the center of popular theater in Rio. At one of its venues, Teatro São José, dedicated to Teatro de Revista, the company had implemented since the early 1910s the so, the so called Teatro por Sessões, or Espetáculos por Sessões, theater in sessions, in which at least three daily runs were scheduled. With this practice, they managed to reduce ticket prices down to the level of movie tickets. Here's the, the ad. So, theater in sessions, movie ticket prices. Similar to film exhibition practices, the program at Teatro São José was constantly being renewed. Although quite controversial, especially among the overworked artists, theater in sessions turned out to be a very efficient practice to attract large audience and to face the competition with films. Even at the, the other two theaters run by the Pascual Segreto Company at Praça Tiradentes, Teatro São Pedro and Teatro Carlos Gomes, the plays were given twice each evening, as you can see in this advertisement. Uh, where you can also observe the, the comparison made between George Walsh and Jaime Costa. This connection to film practices is no surprise, considering that the founder of the company, Pascoal Segreto, had a pioneering role in Brazilian film business. He opened the first fixed venue for film exhibition in 1887, and he was the first to produce local views and short films. Segreto remained active in film business until the early 1910s, when he concentrated most of his activities in theater. Even then, however, cinema continued to be a strong reference for his company, as the practice of theater in sessions demonstrate, demonstrated. After Pascual Segreto's death in 1920, the company kept establishing connections to cinema. When Brutalidade opened the following year, Theatre critic Mario Nunes wrote that a new trend had been discovered, the stage adaptation of su successful film productions. Adaptations might not have become a new trend, but film-related plays seem to have been produced on a regular basis, so much so that in another review of Rod Rodolfo Valentin in 1927, the critic declared that the film belonged to a current genre, <coughs> cinemania, film mania. Considering the, this so-called genre, a quite prolific subgenre comes to mind, comprised by plays featuring characters inspired by Charles Chaplin. Igor Andrade Pontes, in his detailed study of the exhibition and reception of Chaplin's films in Brazil between 1914 and 1922, reports that many plays from Teatro de Revista had a character based on Chaplin's famous screen persona. According to Pontes, uh, this practice seemed to have lasted from uh, the mid-1910s throughout the 1920s. Uh, based on his survey in the newspaper Correio da Manhã, uh, he mentions a list of eight titles of which we had access to three, El Suco, 1918, Se a Bomba Rebenta, 1920, and Carlito in Chico Boya, 1920. The recurrence of Chaplin's character in several stage plays reflected the growth of Hollywood cinema in Brazilian market, 
as well as this artist's increasing popularity. His first films were released in Rio in 1914, and soon later, in the following year, he and his character were nicknamed Carlito or Carlitos. According to Pontes, screenings and releases of Chaplin's films reached a peak between 19, 1919 and 1920. By then, his popularity could be measured not only by the exhibition of his films, but also through the wide coverage he received in the press and the stage performance he inspired, both by his numerous imitators and among stage plays. Carlitos' imitators on stage are precisely the theme of a musical number in the 1918 review Si a Bomba Arrebenta. Literally, if the pump breaks up, something like, if something goes wrong. Uh, yeah, the play. One of the characters is a newsreel cameraman. When a young lady asks for a film featuring Carlitos, he says he has, he has a very interesting one, showing a Carlitos Carlitos' look-alike contest that took place in New York, in which Chaplin himself, one of the contenders, was not the winner. Do you want to watch it? He asked. This is the cue for the entrance of a group of Carlitos' imitators who perform a musical number. The play gets its, its inspiration from the widespread rumors about that contest, of which there is no clear proof. Between facts and legend, imitators and the real one, Carlitos was proving to be an engaging attraction on both stage and screen. In the, other, uh, in the two other plays consulted, Carlitos appears as a stage character. In the review El Suco, literally, it's the juice, another old slang ex ex expression meaning it's the best, one of the sketches take pla takes place in a movie theater lobby. Here's the cover of the play. When the doorman mentions the, the comedy that will be screened, Carlitos tears up the poster and makes his entrance. Despite it being a small part, his amusing brief lines draw attention to the, by the way they mimic fast-paced, silent slapstick comedies, translating into words some of their characteristic situations. So. I left home, bumped into a cop, took a cab, the, cra the car ran fast, skidded in the mud, I fell on the, st on the street, a bike ran over me, and so on. It, it looks like a poem. Uh, although there are no particular stage directions for the Carlitos character in this scene, one can easily picture the actor reproducing on stage Chaplin's well-known acrobatic movements. In the 1920 play Carlito and Chico Boya, Carlitos is the, is the protagonist, along with the very popular slapstick character played by Roscoe Fett Arbuckle, nicknamed Chico Boya in Brazil. The first act starts at the entrance of the movie theater, where several characters appear and talk to the doorman. One of them is an infuriated husband, looking for his wife and her lover, threatening to kill them both. After a while, shots are heard, and patrons run from, the, from inside the theater. <laughs> Among them are Carlitos and Chico Boy, walking like robots. They escape from the doorman, who tries in vain to capture, to capture them and put them back into the, the film can, in the film can. In the following act, Carlitos and Chico Boy find themselves silent and paralyzed in an operating room where they are given the elixir of life. After that, they are involved in dialogues and musical numbers with allegorical characters personifying national theater, politics, the public health service, the city, and the vices, cocaine, gambling, alcohol, cigarettes, among others. Through these scenes, the two foreign visitors are introduced to problems and peculiar situations of the city's everyday life. A typical narrative strategy in Teatro de Revista Reviews to address Brazilian social and political affairs. To that traditional structure, the review Carlito and Chico Boya provides an additional attraction, connecting two of the most famous Hollywood comedians to reality of life in Brazil. 
they interact with well-known urban characters and get acquainted to, with local current events, all of them already familiar to the audience. The pair of film characters also give the review the opportunity to insert elements of slapstick comedy into the plot, as in the above-mentioned El Suco. One of the sketches of Carlito in Chico Boy takes place outside a tenement house from which a number of people run down the stairs to escape from an anarchist who is on the first floor who threatens to explode a bomb. Carlito stands at the bottom of the staircase hitting all the characters that pass him on the head with a hammer. While everyone is still dizzy, tottering around, Carlitos and Chicoboya start to blow heavily, really hard, making all the, all, all the others drop to the ground. In the last act, the stage setting is a big film projector. Carlitos and Chicoboya, finally captured by the, the doorman, are put back into the projector, which starts to work. Although the review usually portrays the two characters in a positive way, emphasizing their the charisma and popularity, the, the conclusion hints to, uh, at something more ambiguous. Before, Cali, before Carlitos and Chico Boya are captured by the doorman, there is a musical number featuring uh, an allegorical character that represents the machixe, the most popular dance in Brazil at the time, also known abroad as the Brazilian tango, the machixe was condemned by many for its sensuous movements and its lower class Afro-Brazilian origins. The review stages a popular protest against the banning of machixe from the list of Brazilian attractions that would be performed to the King of Belgium in this visit to the country later that year, 1920. In the song performed by the machixe character, he complains, the so-called nationalism is ashamed of what is ours. After that musical number, another allegorical character, the popular spirit, enters the stage, managing to trick Carlitos and Chico Boy as a way, according to his line, to pull out of them the fictitious life they had. It is in the following scene that the doorman captures them and puts them back in the film projector. These final sketches cast some ambiguity over the beloved Hollywood characters and their unusual experience amid Brazilian types and controversial affairs. On the one hand, they allow the review to take advantage of the hegemonic Hollywood cinema and star system, while incorporating not only two of its most famous characters, but also some well-known elements from the slapstick comedies they starred in. On the other hand, the review also suggest, suggests a nationalist approach in praise of Brazilian popular culture, often, often undervalued when not overtly attacked. Faced with foreign visitors, whether the real-life king of Belgium or the fictional characters of Carlitos and Chico Boya, the review sheds a positive light on them while also highlighting allegorical characters connected to Brazilian culture, representing the machixe and the popular spirit. It is the popular spirit, indeed, who is responsible for paralyzing the two Hollywood characters, taking from them their fictitious life, lives, so they, they can be captured and put back where they belong, not in, in a Brazilian setting, but in the film projector. This ambiguous approach concerning foreign elements in Brazilian popular culture follows the polysemic nature of Teatro de Revista, as stated by Tiago de Melo Gomes. Being an essentially comic form of entertainment, the Teatro de Revista counted on the polysemic humor to attract a varied audience to the theater. The result was a constant debate on current events in terms that allowed multiple understandings by a diversified audience. In stage plays, many possible meanings also emerge throughout the countless reference to film going. As a matter of fact, stage plays, and reviews in particular, provides a rich yet underexplored source to study film going and film reception. 
In relation to the Hollywood star system, we can keep track through the plays of the main trains and favorite stars. In the 1910s, the popularity of westerns and slapstick comedies and their famous artists such as George Walsh, Charlie Chaplin, Rose Coffetti, Arbuckle. In the mid-1920s, the passionate and also the mocking reactions provoked by Rudolf Valentino. And throughout that decade, the impact of actresses who personified the modern women, the modern woman, such as Bibi Daniels, mentioned in a 1923 review when a group of devils discuss the creation of the perfect woman for modern times. Following this, the, the polysemic nature of Teatro de Revista, cinema and film going could be depicted in a positive light as a major and welcome sign of modernity, yet also looked upon with suspicion as a threat to traditional values. Tiago de Melo Gomes, when discussing gender conventions in the 1920s, 20s, underlines the importance of the movie theater regarding social mores. Being a place where a large number of people who had never met before gathered together in a dark room, among them a, consider a considerable number of young single people, the movie theater uh, attracted great attention not only from journalists but, and playwrights, but also from society as a whole. In the plays, there are countless references to harassment in movie theaters, usually depicted in a light, amusing tone. Still, it's not uncommon to find characters who, despite being portrayed in a satirical way, are able to express many people's concern about cinema's threat to morality. Playing such a central role in city life, the movie theater could not fail to be addressed in the reviews. Moreover, as a space in which people of all kinds circulated, coming from different social classes, races, backgrounds, ages, it provided rich narrative possibilities to be explored. In the review El Suco, in which Carlito tears up, tears up the poster, the sketch in a, uh, in a movie theater lobby brings together an interesting variety of characters. The pair of protagonists, one, of, one a capitalist, the other a review author, who, having bought a ticket for a second-class seat, tries to sneak into the first-class section, the doorman, who mis uh, whose mispronunciation reinforces that he's from the lower classes, an old woman and her young daughter, who is harassed by a man who calls, him, calls himself a respectable family man, the, fe the French female musician who conducts the all-woman orchestra that plays in the lobby and whom the author insistently woos. Concerning film going, it is worth highlighting in the sketch the mixture of different classes that, mo that movie theaters allowed, with all the interactions and tensions that came with it. A range of ticket prices attracted a varied audience that although separated in distinct sections, still shared common areas. The recurring theme of harassment is addressed, always in a humorous tone, in the inappropriate advances both from the supposed respectable man toward the young lady and the author toward the orchestra conductor. <coughs> the presence of female musicians also points, also points to one of the few technical creative positions that women occupy then in Brazilian film activities, apart from those of actresses. In fact, these characters in the review El Suco remind us that a deeper research is yet to be done in Brazil regarding women musician in movie, musicians in movie theaters during the silent period, playing in lobbies or providing accompaniment during screenings. Also revealing and very amusing are the remarks about film genres. In El Suco, the doorman explains to the protagonist what the first film to be screened in the program is about. It is a serial film with 22 episodes. Very complicated, he says the doorman. I have been watching this thing ever since it started and I still don't know which one is the bad guy. 
a highly popular genre among Brazilian audience in 1918, when the review opened, serials could easily puzzle viewers with their action-packed episodes. In the 1920 review, Se a Bomba Rebenta, the presence of the cameraman gives, gives rise to jokes about newsreels, starting with the name of his own newsreel, Paté Carioca, a parodic reference to the French company Paté, who first produced the format. Another dialogue in Se a Bomba Rebenta alludes to the work of many cameramen, often reported in the, in the press by then, who declared they were shooting important events and Brazilian landscapes to be screened abroad. In the review, when asked in which movie theater his films are screened, the cameraman explains that his films are not exhibited in Brazil, but abroad. And he adds, in Paris, London, New York, Botucatu, Pindamonhangaba, and Santa Rita do Passa Quatro. <laughs> of course, the last three cities are not in foreign countries at all. They are, in, they are in the interior of Sao Paulo, and their peculiar names provide an amusing contrast with the three most famous cities in the world. It, it is a playful way to call into question those renowned cameramen and their films, which no one was sure would ever really be screened abroad. Controversial topics regarding local film going are also to be found in, the sta in stage plays. In the 1928 review, Viva a Mulher, Long Live, Wim, Long Live Women, written by stage and film director Luiz Barros, one of the sketches addresses censorship in films and the new rules uh, on child admission to movie theaters through a dialogue between a police inspector and a girl who is barred from watching a film. Although the girl's age is not mentioned, she must be under 14 years old. Shortly before, in 1926, a federal decree had established that no child under 14, year, under 14 was allowed to attend movie theaters in the evenings, unless accompanied by an adult. Besides the minors code, the sketch also takes aim at the state censor board, which used to cut out daring scenes from films, especially kissing scenes. In a rather malicious tone, the sketch ridicules the rigors of censorship and regulations, reinforcing the contrast between them and the bold, even impudent young people they were supposed to protect. The girl complains that when Valentino Ramon Navarro kisses passionately, the film jumps and no one sees anything. She asks the police inspector, what's the big deal about a kiss? Do you think I've never kissed? What do I have a cousin for? Then she adds, I have three cousins, thank God. <laughs> at one point, the girl mentions a statue right at Paulista Avenue, which shows a naked couple kissing. In the movie, she remarks, people don't kiss naked. When the inspector argues that it is a statue with no movement, she replies, so immorality is in the movement then we had better tie everyone in a straitjacket. Of course, this sketch, itself about censorship, ended up being entirely censored, <laughs> as you can see from the red lines crossing out the whole dialogue. In this talk, I have covered, oh, sorry. In this talk, I have covered some connections that stage play established with cinema through different approaches. A film itself being at the center of the plot, commercial ties that link film and stage business, the cinema influence on stage performance and mise-en-scene, the incorporation into the plots of Hollywood stars and characters, peculiar adaptations from screen to stage, and reference to, film and film go to films and film going. To conclude, I would like to resume some of Charles Mercer's consideration on, considerations on the theatrical culture and spectatorship. He draws attention to the general similarities of theatrical spectatorship compared to the, to the diverse and fragmented modes of spectatorship that the history of motion picture contains. He mentions, for, for example, uh, different ways to watch films from peephole machines to classrooms and television. The similarities of theatrical spectatorship are reinforced when Mercer analyze, uh, analyzes African-American theater and film, 
focus on two race films produced in, 19, in the 1920s. He argues that the films, I quote, imagine a theatrical spectator knowledgeable of key contemporary works on the stage and screen. Mercer's observations can be applied to the works, that, to the works addressed here with due regard to difference between the two cases. The systematic and diverse film reference in stage plays imply a spectator familiar with both stage and screen subject matters, stylistic aspect, aspects, and practices. In this sense, still holding Mercer's argument in mind, we can say that, I quote, stage and screen operated a complementary theatrical experience. Sorry, stage and screen operated as complementary theatrical experiences. Exploring intermediality as a historiographic me method, as proposed by our pro ongoing project, opens up challenging perspectives to reframe traditional categories, such as Brazilian cinema and Brazilian films. In this talk, I try to embrace this understanding of theatrical entertainment. Uh, with all the rich intermediate and transnational relations it implies. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Luciana. Fantastic. Um, right, time for some questions, everybody. I've got one up my sleeve in case this <laughs> this moment. So the first performance you're talking to us about, Luciana, had this that had with with the film which featured the um, unfaithful husband and then the mm -hmm. unfaithful lover or the lover who had another lover. Um, the way you described it, it sounded as though the film was as a prologue. It mm -hmm. it wasn't. It was uh, yeah. So it was all shown at the front and it wasn't integrated into the staging of the play in the way that a bit of um, filmed performance, you know, in, in a performance these days we'd imagine that kind of setup to actually encounter the screening partway through the narrative with all the experiences of, of engaging cinematically alongside the characters rather than. But in this context, it was entirely in, encapsulated in the prologue rather mm -hmm. than being integrated in the later performance. Do you have any sense of? Why that was, or does that remind you of any other kinds of practices that were? Uh, I think to it? that um, first it was more practical to do that because you know the projector things and uh, to, to have set all the equipment. Then you projected the prologue, the film prologue, and then started the play. <laughs> I think that was the most uh, uh, easy thing, practical thing to do. Uh, but also, uh, I don't think that. Um, uh, putting the, the film in the middle of the, the play, maybe it could, uh, uh, you know, uh, be a little bit strange for the actors because they followed, they used to follow the, the dialogues, but uh, they also uh, put something more, some something more of their own head. Uh, so it, maybe it was difficult to insert a film in a play that not usually... <laughs> Followed the the script. So, so there was a highly improvisatory quality to the performance. That yes, might have I, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. But uh, at the same time, I think it's uh, very uh, interesting because they they do screen the the film, and it's a kind of, of story that we we will find a very similar story on a, a Louis Feuillard film called Erreur Tragique. Tragic mistake. It's the same. It's the same thing. The, the the husband go goes to the movies and he sees a film where his wife is with another man, and then it's very interesting because there's a this meta linguistical thing because he he bu buys the, the 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 film and then at home he, he tries to look at it and uh, guessing oh, who is this guy, uh, but then. Uh, uh, the, this reference to, to Feyad film is just to say that this kind of plot were, was already on the air, was already uh, found in many uh, media, uh, both in stage and, and screen. Great, thank you very much. Right, another question. 
Jonathan. Um, yes, thank you. That's a really interesting um, paper. One of the things that I wanted to ask you was um, about the significance of stardom. It seems that uh, in the culture you were talking about, um, cinema, ideas about cinema are kind of condensed around the figures of stars, like Charlie Chaplin or Rudolph Valentino. So the star is a kind of is a kind of entry point into a kind of world of what cinema means. Um, and yet you were talking about performers in Brazil who seemed to imitate or impersonate stars. So the stars were not really unique. They are available to be, um, to be reworked or reinterpreted in the Brazilian context. So uh, is it right that, uh, that for your argument that stardom is a kind of key um, way in which um, performances across between theatre and cinema Yes, definitely. But um, uh, for this point as well, uh, we have to bear in mind the, 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 the polysemic uh, strategy of Teatro de Revista because, uh, of course, the Hollywood stars were majors and were very famous and very popular. But at least in Rio and Sao Paulo, also the, the stage actors uh, were very famous themselves. Um, so both of these attractions were, were valued and were uh, very and were very present. Because, uh, for instance, when we think about uh, movie prologues in 1926 in, in Rio in Cinelândia, uh, movie prologues were uh, stage presentations before the the, the, the film, uh, and these presentations were. Re- linked to the film. Uh, film magazines complained that how can you do that? Because the film is started uh, Adolf Menjou and the prologue is the a Brazilian comedian. You cannot compare one with another. But to the theatrical audience, both the screen or, uh, for screen and stage, that Brazilian comedian <laughs> was very popular and was a uh, uh, a selling point to the to the attraction. Um, so I, I believe that the the Hollywood star system had, of course, his huge in- impact. But at the same time, uh, stage Brazilian actors also uh, were very popular. So when you when we see this this ad uh, comparing Jaime <laughs> Costa and Rudolf Valentino. Of course, we had both pictures are from Jaime Costa. <laughs> but there is this, uh, the, this comparison between the, the two of them. Uh, and of course, uh, if you uh, research on, on film magazines, they deploy this kind of things. Because to them, cinema was the most important thing in the world. How can one compare film with, you know, second-rate plays and popular plays who, uh, that were very uh, undervalued. But in, in fact, when we research and we see all the advertisement and the promotion and uh, all the plays the, the, the actors featured, so uh, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, avoid to, to think that they were really important. The Brazilian actors were really important as well. Yeah. Um, yes, I was going to ask you about the venues for popular entertainment um, and whether at this time there isn't any sort of institutionalisation of cinema being a sort of a, a separate sort of venue for cinematic performances and are the very venues and spaces where these, these exhibits are taking place encouraging a sort of intermedial staging mm-hmm. of events so that there's space for musicians there's also space for performances, different lighting effects, so that in a way the very experience of going into the cinema is already an, an intermediate one, or the, or, the, or the theatrical space, and I wonder whether you've done any work on the sort of architectures of intermediality mm-hmm. that might absolutely inform some of this as well. No, absolutely. Uh, uh... I did not address uh, did not address uh, the venues, the movie theaters, and the theaters because it's such a universe of its own. Uh, but at uh, that time, uh, 
1910s and, and 20s, there were many cine theatres, uh, movie, uh, movie theatres were also where sta plays were staged, and you, you have this, combina the, this combinated programme. Uh, and also, uh, movie theatres and theatres would change uh, from time to time. At this uh, moment where I, uh, I researched, Teatro São José was only a theatre to stage plays. But before that, it has been uh, a movie theatre, and after that as well. Um, from 1927 on, uh, Teatro São José turned into a movie theatre again. Uh, and this, of course, and the, the place uh, is very important as well, because Praça Tiradentes, Tiradentes Square, was a, a, a place known uh, for their for its venues um, of, with popular theater, uh, like, like Teatro Carlos Gomes, Teatro São José, Teatro São Pedro. Okay, both three of them, by, headed by company Pascoal Segreto, and then um, not very far from there, there was and there still in there still is Cinelândia where the main movie theatres were. But even in these movie theatres uh, at Cinelândia, some of them were cine theatres, with both stage and, and screen attractions. Uh, so this kind of uh, intermediate relation, uh, it, it, it took place in the same venue, in the same space, in the same space. That's very, very interesting. It's very interesting that you just mentioned uh, the idea of this film about this protagonist who found out that his wife is cheating on him because of the film evidence. And the same with the view of your film where she finds out the mean, like, you know, the opposite. But uh, what I would like to talk about is the film evidence. And, um, well, it's actually more like a comment, and if you want to, you know, just talk more a little bit more about this. Uh, I, well, I'm Brazilian, so I know how difficult it is to find this kind of piece of information on our research is about Brazilian uh, film and theater and uh, all kind of art history. Sometimes we don't have films, we don't have evidence anymore to, to prove it. For instance, I work in Cinelandia, the neighborhood where you, you know, we, have, we used to have many film theaters and, you know, uh, and now uh, you don't have it anymore, actually. Many of them were taken by churches or what kind of business. So there, what happened was a deletion of the place of, you know, the whole uh, cinema culture in Brazil, we know, has been changed. So I just wanted you, if you can talk a little bit more about the work of researching on so hard, uh, hard situation that we live in Brazil uh, to research our own history. And uh, that's how, uh, that's why I think uh, intermediality, the idea of having this as a tool for historiographic uh, research is very interesting also, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's yeah I've, most of the plays uh, I found at Arquivo Nacional in Rio de Janeiro right. because of censorship. Uh, they, they had to be submitted to censorship. Uh, some of them I found uh, at Miro El Silveira Archive archive in, in Sao Paulo, uh, also because they were submitted to censorship. And it's amazing to, for instance, this uh, El Suco, I'm, I'm kind of fetishist, but I, I know it's a kind of fetishist, but I, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> it's a, a 1918 play that you get into your hands and with all these drawings, and, and it's fantastic. Manuscript, and so, uh, and then uh, I had already studied some some plays, uh, but now that I went deeper, uh, I found out many many references and many connections to uh, to film and to culture in, in general. That's not novelty, and I must say that. I'm very enthusiastic about the plays, and uh, comparing to, to Brazilian silent cinema, which is so conservative, 
the plays uh, give such a fresh air to, to our study because they are very... Uh, uh, they, they go into, into uh, all these uh, complexities of modernity. The, the, the female characters are much more interesting and much more complex than in what we see in, in Brazilian silent films. Uh, so for me, it's been very, first of all, very amusing <laughs> to, to study those plays and also to, to compare them uh, with Brazilian films and, uh, and, and to understand all of, of the relations they, they established between uh, the relations between uh, film and, and, and stage. But then I think that this relations to because uh, because I cut uh, a small part on a, a film uh, called Augusto Nibo Que Casar, a 1923 film, uh, because it has a, a strong connection to Teatro de Revista and Bataclan, the French Bataclan. But I cut it. But I think that even that we can uh, find some. Brazilian films uh, who, who are very related to to the, to the stage, most of them directed by Luis Barro, de Barros, who is a very interesting filmmaker I've been studying. I think that the most prolific and the most rich comparison comparisons uh, are, could be made with uh, the musical films and chanchadas from the 30s and 40s and 50s, because then you have the sound. And those plays, in those plays, sound, dialogues, music, they are essential to, to the plays. So the silent cinema uh, uh, lack, lack that. So the, when, you, when we come to the chanchadas and film musicals from the 30s, there you can explore, uh, you can deeper explore the, the relations to, the, to this place. I, I believe that. Hey, Luciana. I'm sorry, sorry I arrived late and I really apologise if, if I'm going to ask something that you talked about. But I, I absolutely share your passion for these <laughs> the plays. I've only come across a few in the archive and I've seen all that I've looked at. But um, I agree with you that it's the language and the kind of uh, the, immediate, the immediacy that the language gives you that, that kind of makes them so, for me anyway, and for you evidently, you know, so kind of fascinating. Um, and I, I just wondered, um, and I'm sorry if you said this earlier, but I, I came in about 20 minutes before the end. Um, do, do you think, in terms of um, the way they talk, the plays talk about cinema, particularly Hollywood, is there a mixture of kind of uh, reverence and irreverence? Because the ones that I came across, it was, it was quite an irreverence, particularly just in the, the play of language, you know, the way they mispronounce deliberately the names of stars, like not just Hollywood stars, but Josephine Baker and mm -hmm. Harold Lloyd. And, it's, and I wonder whether, for me anyway, as you just said as well, that clearly links with this kind of chanchada irreverence towards Hollywood as well. So I wonder, does that start early, as early as the, the 1910s, 20s, or is it more of a kind of, a kind of citation of, of these Hollywood stars without kind of debunking them by, by humor, or mm -hmm. is it a mixture? Yeah, definitely. I think that I think that there is this uh, ambiguity uh, in the way they address Hollywood stars and Hollywood films because they are passionate about it, about it. But at the same time, uh, there are some critic, uh, some criticism, and some <laughs> resistance to embrace them completely. And as I, I said about the. The play Carlito and Chico Boya, uh, they are very, uh, they are very highlighted. But, but then you you sense that, well, the, their place is not among us. Their place is not among Brazilian reality. So the so-called Brazilian reality. Their, their place is in the film, in the screen, back to the film projector, not among us. They don't belong. 
to it's to just this. Just like Chanchal's in the fifties, isn't it? You know, yeah. no Sanson, no Dalila, neither Samson nor Delilah. Mm -hmm. Brazilian cinema can't do this. It's not our culture, and it's, so it's this. It's kind of assuming. It's it's mocking. Um, it's almost self-deprecating as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So saying we we can't compete with this at some level. Yeah, but I know I don't think well. Maybe of course, I, 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 I have read not, not that much of the plays, but I don't think there is this uh, self how, how deprecation. This? deprecation. Yeah, I, I don't feel that. Maybe that comes uh, I think in the plays, uh, uh, they are much more vigorous and not defending national Not defending, rights. not, not uh, depreci depreciating mm -hmm. themselves, because I think. People already depreciated them so much. <laughs> Teatro de Revista was, the, you know, the popular thing. So uh, considered the, the second-rate stuff. Uh, even when you read uh, the history of the of Brazilian theater, they start from at the the forties with Nelson Rodrigues, uh, with Nelson Rodrigues play uh, Vestido de Noiva. They completely ignore what has come before because. It, the same as people uh, said about Sunshine, that that's not cinema. Teatro de Revista, that's not theater. <laughs> so, uh, and I think in the plays, they, they are very, very strong about themselves. And they are so, uh, uh, so free that they even uh, joke about, the, the, about, about themselves, about their practices. For instance, this, this practice called Teatro por Sessões, theater in sessions, in the play, uh, well, may maybe Carlito in Chico Boya, uh, there is a sketch where they, they stage uh, uh, a theater in sessions, and each act is uh, two line long. And what? The, the character says, what? It's already gone? Yeah, it's theater in sessions. It must be quick. So, <laughs> and in, in the plays, they, they, made, made, they make fun of themselves. But always, in a very amusing way, I don't feel at all uh, this kind of complex of the viralata, <laughs> this, this dog complex, complexity. But I don't, don't feel that. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very, for those excellent questions. And thanks again, Lucy. Let's Thank go and have much. some tea.